This is GRL Raw, the podcast where the GRL team tells you why they're different. Who the hell are they? Why should you want them fighting for you? The industry leader in law with over 180 years of combined experience. This team is here to shed light on crucial topics in law to keep you aware and informed because it comes back to the primary point. We give a damn. Welcome to the second official edition of GRL Raw. I am your host for today, Bobby Ray Kemper, and I am joined by Grant the Wizard Gangstead. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. We start every episode off. We have some nicknames around the office, and people need to know what's behind the nickname. So Grant the Wizard Gangstead. By the way, this episode... We've, I came up with a title. You ready? Motorboating with the Wizard. Captain Wizard. Captain Wizard. Thank you for correcting that. I like it. Okay. Well, where did Wizard come from? Uh, early on in my career, uh, there was a real young kid I had as a client, and he had a couple issues going on at the same time, and uh, we ended up getting a pretty – pretty favorable outcome in his case and his mom said oh my god you must be some kind of wizard can I give you a hug and so I got a hug and uh, got the nickname the wizard I guess out of that so it's probably been around for eight nine years now yeah, I think it's stuck so it has, it has when, stuck. When, you, when you get given a name like that you have to own it you have to keep it and right. the wizard I mean dope Yoda the magician the wizard it, it's been fantastic I'll take it I'll yeah. take it so okay as we like to say in court what qualifies you, Mr. Grant the Wizard Gangstead, to talk to us all about motorboating? Well, um, I have motorboated. <laughs> uh, no, I, I uh, my mom and my grandparents, they, they lived at Lake Cornelia up in north central Iowa forever, all while I was growing up. My okay. grandparents lived there. Um, Aunts and uncles had boats. We were out there boating every summer as much as we could. Um, My mom moved out to the lake when I was out of high school. Um, Got a pontoon boat. Oh, that's perfect. College kid, pontoon. Absolutely. We were out there, you know, every weekend we could. And uh, I've been around lakes and boats and that stuff all my life. So... And you kind of turned the boating world in Iowa upside down with one case argued two times. That's right. And then it got kind of, we don't got talk under, about what happened. a little bit, yeah. yeah. But, State versus Petty John. That's right. That was your baby. That was. That was uh, a case that uh, I started the year that I started practicing. Yep. And uh, through all the appeals and everything, um, it came out about four, a little over four years later, the final decision on that one. So 2013, 2017 is when it came out. So it was a... Uh, Labor of love, definitely. It was, so. and ultimately that decision said, at least for time being, that they couldn't threaten fines and couldn't threaten disqualifications of, of your privilege to vote, which what really wasn't a privilege, um, in order to get somebody to consent to breath testing in a boating while intoxicated case, right? That's right. <clears throat> so the, the boating while intoxicated statute how it differs from the OWI statute, the driving statute. Uh, the boating while intoxicated statute said, if you refuse to provide a breath, blood, or urine test to the officer at their request, they can slap you with a monetary penalty. For a first refusal, it's 500 bucks. Second refusal, 1,000. Third refusal, I think it was 1,500 or 2,000. And um, the court said that that penalty was inherently coercive, yeah. and anybody who consents to those tests uh, are doing so under threat of coercion. Those were, those were uh, uh, thrown out, essentially, uh, said that that portion of the implied consent law was not constitutional. And we're going to dig into some motorboating basics and some of the, the advanced course on motorboating as well here um, as we get going. But first, we got to step, take a step back. We have some updates. We have some information what's going on with GRL over this past month since the last uh, episode. And... The biggest, most importantest update of all time, you get to announce. Baby DeVries? That's the baby. Yeah. You can't, no, there's no bigger than babies. Yeah. 
so my legal assistant, Leilani, uh, she had her second child just this past week, had a little boy, um, Makoa James, I think yes. is the name, right? Yes. Cool name. So and we got oh, there's going to be a picture, so we're we're going to have some visual aid. We're starting an episode off with pictures of babies. You can't go wrong. That's we, right. We can only go downhill from there. So mom and baby are doing good, and we're uh, we're excited for the DeVries family. And we already so. need her back soon. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Take all the time you need, Leilani. You have all the time, all the time. Uh, other update: we bragged about it that uh, uh, Sydney Ross, um, she's clerked for us for two two, two since years. COVID, two yeah. years. Yep. Um, super smart. Um, she was waiting on her bar exam results last time, and we regret to inform everybody that um, she passed. She did. She passed, not just what passed, but, like, they didn't do this in our days, right? No. No, no, no. The, the, the ranking. The bar, ranking. Yeah. Absurd. In the top 1% of all bar takers nationwide, absolutely ridiculous. She was convinced she failed. Everybody thinks we all were. We all I were. think I think if you don't think you failed, you failed. You didn't do enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you if you think you passed, you didn't with the bar exam. Um, NFGs updates, case updates. Um, anything happen? You got anything fun? Uh, I just got handed a <laughs> loss yesterday. That's never fun, but uh, suppression motion. Yeah. But uh, starting trial tomorrow with Corey. Perfect. Um, Collins in trial today. Collins in trial today. Jim even had a trial. Jim, Jim had a trial. even had a trial. He did on Monday. Transaction. Yep. Jim. Um, That's right. I'm theoretically in trial next week. We did have what I'm calling an NFG. Midway through the month, trial started. State finally tapped halfway through, and then um, that's we, a win. It, it's a win. It, and a you win. know what? That one gets an NFG shirt for sticking it through. And then they they backed off. They, yeah. When it comes down, somebody's accused of a sex offense and the state agrees to dismiss a sex offense, you can plead guilty to a misdemeanor, non-sexually related offense. That's, we're, we're calling that an NFG. Absolutely. Um, state versus Murphy came out. We got an appeal where our guy... Nice work. Nice work, but passed up a deferred judgment right, so that he could appeal. It's um, a gutsy move. It's a gut, you, gotta, you, gotta have, you gotta believe in uh, your case, That's and right. it, it paid off for him. Couldn't, couldn't be happier for him. And then I'm excited with the fact that we have a new hire tentatively, hopefully starts here in a couple, I think a week. Next, yeah, next week. We got to come up with a nickname for, for her, but currently the uh, leading nickname is Machine Gun Madison. I like it. Um, as a receptionist, uh, par not paralegal, but uh, administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. And on her side business is, or her, her primary, or she has a business that is firearm safety, firearm instruction, specifically tailored to women. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a fun, we're going to have to have her on and have a good discussion 100%, with her 100%. about that. So we're going to take a quick break, learn a little bit more about Grant the Wizard Gangstead. And when we come back, we are going to dive into the meat of motorboating in Iowa. Grant Gangstead has been with GRL Law since 2010 and has been in practice for 10 years. His primary areas of practice are criminal defense and personal injury, emphasizing operating while intoxicated charges, drug crimes, asset forfeiture, and motor vehicle injury claims. Grant is a solid legal advocate, having had great success in criminal and civil matters. He has tried numerous cases to verdict and argued and won multiple cases in front of the Iowa Court of Appeals and Iowa Supreme Court. During his time in practice, Grant has been selected to the super lawyers list for seven straight years. Grant enjoys spending time with his family outside of the courtroom, along with hunting, fishing, camping, and the outdoors. Grant embraces the attitude of aggressive representation and zealous advocacy that is shared by all the attorneys at GRL Law and prides himself on getting results for his clients. Motorboating with Grant the Wizard Gangstead. You know what I love most about those attorney profile videos that we just saw? What's that? Everybody wrote their own. So to a certain extent, each one of those, I didn't mess with them. Uh, the crew didn't mess with them. It was what you wanted to convey, how you wanted to convey it. Everybody got to use their own creativity. It shows in that. And so 
you grew up on the water. You're an yep. avid outdoorsman. Yep. I've met Hank, mm. Hank the Tank. Yep, my dog. He's, yep. a, he's a bad man. He talks to you if, if you feed uh, his owner enough beers. That's right. Yep. He's he got does. a he's got a voice. He does. So you are a lifelong boater. Would that be fair? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I am a noobs when it comes to boating. I grew up in Hawaii. We didn't have boats. Yeah. You had surfboards, that surfboards, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so as I, I'm going to learn some things, I'm going to learn some things. You are going to drop some serious knowledge as only the wizard can. But let's start with, as an experienced boater, El Capitan Major, what are some, or what's your biggest pet peeve on the water? I would have to say probably um, discourteous boaters. Yeah. Dis discourteous boaters or, or inconsiderate boating. Um, people blasting right next to your boat going way too fast. Um, you know, uh, people getting too close to you when you're towing a skier or a tuber, um, people littering, you know, just common sense, civil stuff, you know, just, just be, just be a good person out there and being safe. So in, in other words, you don't have to know the specific rules. You don't have to have read and memorized the manual to at least appreciate that there's other people on the water. There's other people trying to enjoy the water may not be in your, your same way, but everybody wants to stay safe and comfortable. Right, yeah. right. I mean, it's just common sense stuff, a lot of it, you know. It, it should be. It yeah. should be, right. like, like life in general. Right. So mine, I'll share, is um, getting yelled at by the Department of Natural Resources for something that you did not even know was a thing. So as a newbie boater, um, I, <laughs> I had a... We have a place on Lake Panorama, mm -hmm. and we let the kids go out in a canoe. I thought I was equipping them well with the appropriate flotation devices as were required. I even thought I had everything registered appropriately. Um, they were literally paddling from our place across the water to a beach to hang out, and then they paddled back, only to be followed by the friendly local DNR Water Patrol officer. DNR Water Patrol. Certainly. Like the Lake Patrol people out there, they're, they're laid back. Um, this guy was not laid back. And he laid into me like, he flat out told me that, you know, I was going to drown the kids and I didn't care about them, didn't love them, didn't care for them. Um, I thought it was a little excessive. Uh, I didn't know. Right. I did mm. not know that a, uh, throwable those cushions mm -hmm. i did not know that that didn't count as a life jacket if people could swim in a damn canoe no that, didn't know no. so why don't we why don't we start off with dropping some knowledge and talking about some, what i got yelled at for well that was one of like three things but what i got yelled at for primarily was inappropriate life jackets life preservers mm -hmm. um what we need to know about what you got to have on your boat sure on your vessel as you like to say so um, the, the issue that you had was the type of flotation device that you had for your kids. There's different types. There are different types. There's, a, there's five types. Okay. Um, we, we can talk about those now or we can talk about them in a let's second. Let's talk about them now. Let, okay. Let's go through each of the types okay. and what they are, what they're not, when you need okay. to have them. We brought some props today. Yes, we, so, did. we did. I'm excited um, about that. So you want to grab them? Yeah, we'll grab okay. them. So five types. Um, Hold on, you gotta get by the you gotta yep, get by the mic. Yep, I'm gonna grab this one first. So this one, I'll grab this one. You grab okay. that one. All right, here we go. So we got a couple different types here. Um, this, These are the tacky orange ones, like you see right. at summer camp. Right. In the bottom of a canoe. Right. And and everybody has a big pack of these on their boat. You know. Um, this this was not in the canoe when I when I got yelled at. See that this would have this would have saved you. But, okay. So this is this one. Literally, is, right? <laughs> exactly. This one is a type two. Uh, life preserver. Um, this one is totally fine as far as uh, you know, having it in a boat. You have to have a life preserver type one, two, three, or five for each person. This is a type two, so this would be just fine. Um, there is a type one that looks a lot like this, except it's a lot thicker. The headrest or the head portion is a lot thicker. It's for deeper open water. Um, and uh, that is something that you would probably be looking at if you were going to be waiting a while to be 
to be uh, in the rescued, ocean. Right, in the right. ocean, maybe Deep, on the Mississippi. Water, keeps your head up if yep. you were to get knocked out or something. Just does a little better job of floating you. So the big orange ones, or the, they're not that big. Mine might be a little bit uh, dirty. But so uh, orange ones, like you see, at summer camp required one for everybody on a boat? Correct, correct. Every single person on the boat, there needs to be a life jacket for each each and every person, including the driver. Okay, so type one, we don't have. Chances are in Iowa, probably not gonna need. You, type, it looks a lot like type two, but you're gonna see a lot more type twos. But Very similar. And type one is not required. No, you don't have to have a type one. Okay. You can have so a type, type two, two will do. Yep. Type two They're is They're cheap, fine. you buy them by the pack. Yep, yep. What do we have here? It's a type three, right here. Um, type three would be more like your, your skiing or your tubing kind of, uh, kind of life jacket. Um, they don't provide as much flotation, I guess, as the type twos do. Or they don't for have your, the neck. Right, for your head, to keep your head up and out of the water. But they are completely fine and completely safe for having uh, on the boat, one for each person. Again, they're, they're just fine, but you see them a lot, tubers, skiers, things like that. Okay, so we have to have either a type two, type three, we skip type four, and then go to so type, type five. One, two, three, or five. One or for each person. On a boat. Correct. A motorboat. What about a sailboat? Uh, sailboat's the same thing. To, uh, motorboat, sailboat. Those are going to both be the same as far as um, as far as uh, the flotation device required. Okay. So we have one not necessary. Two makes sense. Mm -hmm. Three easy. Four, we're skipping mm -hmm. for now because we're talking about what people have to wear, correct? correct? Correct. Now, what's something important that everybody needs to understand about wearing life jackets as it relates to age? So if you are over the age of 12, you don't actually have to wear the life jacket while, it is, while the boat is underway. So okay. while, you're, while you're boating or you're moving, you don't have to wear it. If you are 12 and under, those kids need to have life jackets on while you're underway. So... so Boat moving, sailboat, yep. motorboat. Correct. Rowboat? Uh, no. Rowboat. Rowboat is, they don't have to, well, a kid. Yeah, a kid, okay. a kid's going to have to have it on. But, um, yeah, if you, are, if you are on a paddle paddleboard or uh, you're in a canoe, rowboat, something like that, yeah, you got to have it. it. So it makes sense. Children 12 and under mm -hmm. have, the, have the vest on, secured, properly Correct. fit. Correct tight enough that it doesn't fall off over their head right. if they get in the water. It's got to be correctly fitting. It can't be made for a, you know, XXL adult mm -hmm. uh, when they're a 60 pound kid. So you know, my, my favorite is the next one. So what's this thing? So this is a type five. So I, I think this is yours. It is. Okay. Um, and this would be some, okay. I think you wear this when you paddleboard. But, uh, you know, people will have them if they're, like, um, windsurfing or something like that. Something that's not going to inhibit your ability to perform the water sport that you're doing. But this one, actually, I think this one pops with a, with a cylinder. Do it's it. Gotta... Do it. No, no, no. That... Hold on. You got to hold you it Go up. ahead and pull it. No, no, I'll you pull, pull it. it. All right. Ready? It. Ready? What happens? Come on. Pull it. I'm drowning. There we go. Sweet. So it, it pops up. <laughs> there you go. And it's got a little cartridge here. Uh, that's the CO2 that just blew that up. And this, so. is, like, this is like the flight attendants on the, uh, on the airplane. You, right. get the you can blow into the tube if it doesn't inflate it. properly. Correct. Yep. So this, this boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. The reason I have this, we we'll throw it off to the side now. Right. Um, the reason that I have that is I did my due diligence after getting yelled at by the friendly DNR. Mm -hmm. who was there to correct me, um, you have to have, you have to be wearing a Type 5 life jacket on a freaking paddle board mm -hmm. in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think everywhere, technically. I, I can't speak to everywhere, but I think that's probably right. I think we've probably adopted the U.S. Coast Guard recommendations. So, and that, so I grew up in a place where you didn't wear life jackets ever right. in Hawaii, in the ocean, surfing, body, bodyboarding, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have to have a life jacket on to surf. It messes your tan lines. Right. It's inconvenient. Right. It's uncomfortable. Uh, some, someday somebody's going to explain to me why we have to have 
one of those on a paddleboard in a lake. Do you have a good explanation? I, I mean, I, I don't make the rules. I, I just, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you what they are here today. But I think that one is wearable, technically wearable. So that is, that is sufficient. Does it give you as much protection as a type one or a type two or even a type three? Absolutely not. Probably not as, not well, as much if I'm flotation. Out, if I'm knocked out on my paddleboard, because people go by me too close, like they, they love to do, they think mm -hmm. that's funny. See, if they knock you off. Um, that's not going to do me any good. But well, it's, it's the rules. better than nothing. And right? I've learned you wear it, you show it, wearing it, mm -hmm. and they leave, leave you be. Right. So that gets us to type four. Type four, right. This is, this is what I got in trouble for. Right. This so. is what I thought counted as a life jacket in a canoe. I was wrong. You were wrong. You were I wrong. was wrong. This, this is the type four throwable, uh, throwable flotation device. Um, this, there has to be one of these on each boat. Um, so in case you got, say you're, you're, you're anchored up and you're out swimming and somebody isn't a great swimmer, they had maybe too, too many drinks. Pulls a muscle. Pull a muscle, uh, get a cramp. Um, this can be thrown to them to, to save them if they're, if they're really struggling. Does it have to be connected to a rope or you just get the, you just gotta no, be able to chuck it? No, it doesn't need to be connected to a rope. That's why they call it a throwable. So you can, I mean, you could whip it out there as far as you wanted to, to get, you know, save somebody who's, you know, having, having a struggle. So that's what it's for. I bet Hank would be able to retrieve it. He probably would. <laughs> he probably would. Okay. So this is what I got in trouble for. Not sufficient. No as your life jacket correct but required on, on any vessel correct so you have to have one for each person plus the throwable um personal Pad paddle boards you just gotta be wearing something right personal right. watercraft right. let's talk about that personal watercraft so like jet skis um sea dews that kind of a thing got to be wearing them uh got to be wearing a life jacket most of the time you're going to see the type three uh life jacket that people so, are wearing on those so regardless of age you have to have a life jacket on on a jet ski, that kind of thing. Right, you're supposed to. Well, you're gonna get you're gonna get a ticket otherwise. Probably get right. a ticket as opposed to yelled at for right. that one. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. your tan line, you're gonna have a tan line. You are gonna have a tan line on a, on a jet ski. But it's it's safety. That's right. right. Um, anybody who's being uh, another thing, I guess I just thought about this. Anybody who's being towed, so a skier, a tuber, a wakeboarder, they have to have a life jacket on. I got a question. Mm-hmm. Do you have to have a life jacket on while inner tubing down a river? Uh, I, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I don't know either. I, I, don't, I don't know if you do or not. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm sure there's liability issues with companies that, that, uh, that rent those out, I don't, but I don't know the answer to that question. Co Costa Rica for spring break, I asked the guy, we had helmets? And a life jacket and i did one of those really dude like i mean i get that we're tourists and you don't want us to sue you but do we really need this and he was like oh you'll see he was right we went over some boulders and it was crazy yeah i get it but like down the raccoon river we'll say check in we'll have to you know yes. what i think i think we should do it we'll, we'll do it we'll do a follow-up segment or a follow-up blog we could we could do it at the raccoon river at the raccoon river that'd be even better <laughs> So, okay, so we've, we've hit life jackets, yeah. uh, hit personal safety devices or things that you got to wear to keep right. yourself safe mm -hmm. and to keep you from getting a ticket or scolded um, by uh, Department of Natural Resources. Right. So let's talk about boozing and boating. Because isn't, so, isn't, I mean, boating's made for boozing, right? Like that's kind I, of they're, they kind of go hand in hand. A lot of people do both of those activities simultaneously. So, um, I think there's a, a lot of people who don't know uh, whether or not you, know, you can drink on a boat. Can you legally drink on a boat in Iowa? The answer is yes, you can. Sweet. Okay. You can have open containers on a boat. Um, the driver cannot be impaired. The driver cannot be under the, or under the influence. So in, in a vehicle, you can't have open containers in, the vehicle, right. within, in a normal passenger vehicle. Correct. On the road in Iowa. Correct. Passengers on a boat can have their yep. booze crews, just like gin this. and tonic crews, yep. open, consumable, the whole way. Yep, absolutely. What about the driver? Driver can drink as well. Really? So you can drink and drive you, as you, you just cannot you cannot be impaired 
okay. as a driver of a of a boat. How do you know when you're impaired? Well, <laughs> it, there's a couple different ways, right? Uh, so um, there's there's two ways to be impaired or under the influence in Iowa. Uh, one is the per se limit. The per se limit for English English. So the legal limit okay. in Iowa, point um, oh eight, just like for driving. Yep. So it is, um, it is the same for boating as it is for driving. Right. Good right. to know. Or uh, if they don't have a test, you can't be under the influence. Impaired. Impaired. Drunk. Right. Drunk. Okay. Um, okay. Losing your mental faculties, you know, your ability to physically control your, your, your motor functions, right? So before we get to into more of that, what, if I'm on my paddleboard, mm -hmm. does that count? Can I be over 08 on my paddleboard? So qualifying vessels for operating while intoxicated, motorboats, sailboats. Those are the, those are the, those are the, uh, so paddleboard, I'm good. No sail, no motor. Public intox maybe? You could. Yeah. Okay. You get a public intox. That'd take work though. You I mean. would have to be really <laughs> doing something goofy on your paddleboard to get a yeah. public intox. So a motorboat, if it's got a motor, if it's, uh, and it has to be, does it have to be on plane or is there anything like, I know they were trying to do something where it had to be up and moving. It's just, if you're driving a motorboat. If you are that. operating okay. a motorboat or a sailboat. So behind the wheel, motorboat, yeah. or behind the rudder of a sailboat with the sail up. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yep. Surfboard. Not so much, but subject to intox. Canoe, same kind of situation, right? Right. Kayak, same thing. Uh, foot pedal board or back, uh, what do you call those? Uh, paddle paddle boats. Paddle boat. Yep. Not can hammer. Not it a up. motor. Not a sail. Yep. Doesn't okay. qualify. Um, so one thing that word of caution that we've seen in the past, we call it the good old double whammy. What is the double whammy? So I guess maybe we should first make clear that in, in a charge for operating a motorboat while intoxicated good point, good point, good point. does not impact your ability to operate a motor vehicle. There is, no, um, there is no driver's license revocation that happens as a result of a boating while intoxicated case. So let's stop real quick though and say who can operate so it's, if it doesn't impact your driving on a road your license to drive on a road right who can operate a motorboat or sailboat in iowa so there is no driver's license for a for a boat yeah i've never um, taken that test no no nope. if you're 18 years old you can drive a boat you can operate a boat even if you don't know how even if you don't know how it's like uh you know the 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 idiot that goes out and buys a you know dodge viper and ruins it on the way out of the yeah. on the way out of the the uh the parking lot or the dealership um they'll let you buy a boat take it out of there and you could go <laughs> run it into a dock right away if you wanted to okay. um there is no there's no testing there is no uh competency that you have to show over 18 18, 18 and over old. nothing like that any 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 grown-up of age can drive a boat right that's scary. Okay. So 12 to 17, um, they can operate alone if they have taken the an approved boater safety course. And the approved boater safety courses are on the DNR's website. Can, can they operate it under the supervision of any 18-year-old plus dummy if they haven't done that course? They can. You can actually operate under the age of 12 if you have not taken a course, but you have parental supervision. So if I'm 10... I can operate the John boat while dad sits in the front and fishes. And drinks beer. As long as he's not intoxicated. <laughs> okay. Because that would make you in yeah. that Because they are, they're going to be responsible for the under. There the under might be some person. child endangerment issues. Yeah, there. I think probably. Yeah. And world endangerment. Okay. Right. So, but to make it clear, if somebody were to drink too much, drive a boat, get busted, mm -hmm. when they get asked to take that test at the station. Correct. Their decision on that test, whether they take it or refuse it, cannot and does not impact their driver's license for a normal motor vehicle on the highway. Correct. They cannot have their driver's license taken, their ability to operate a vehicle, a car, on the roadway from that decision. It can't impact their right to 
drive a boat. That's right. Their boating privileges, right. but not normal vehicle. Correct. Okay, that's good to know. That's great to know. That's important for everybody to know. So going back to what we were going to talk about, right. the double whammy. The double whammy. So say, you know, the, let's envision a, a hypothetical here where a driver of a boat has been out on the water all day, been out drinking with friends in the sun, um, you know, clanging around on the waves, and you're ready to head in for the night, head to the, to the marina, the boat dock, whatever. Um, you pull up, you tie off on the dock, uh, you go up to the parking lot, get your truck and your trailer. Because you're, you're the only one that sometimes, knows, how to, knows how to back yeah, that trailer down. Sometimes you're the only one, okay. right? Um, and so you go get the trailer, you get the, the truck, the trailer, you back it in, um, you get the boat on the trailer, secure it down, tie it down, um, and you go to pull the boat out. You get to the top of the ramp, and DNR officer standing there stops you and says, hey, I'm going to chat with you real quick. Um, they watched you do the entirety of that. You know, they mm -hmm. watched you pull the boat in. They watched you go get the truck. They watched you load it up. Like, they're literally sitting up there with binoculars Correct. watching what's going on. Right, right. Especially 4th of July holidays. What's yep. coming up? 4th beginning? of July, Memorial Day, Memorial Day. Uh, Labor Day, yep. big boating holidays. So they'll sit up there. You know, they see you stumbling maybe a little bit. They see you offloading some beer cans maybe. Um, Whole boat's covered in the bottom of the boat's covered right, with beers. Right, everybody getting out of their piers, you know, like they've been drinking. Um, they'll stop you, you know, uh, just you know, want to check on you real quick, and they'll smell alcohol, and they'll start an investigation into potential impairment. Well, as we stated earlier, boating cannot get you a license revocation for driving your vehicle. It can get you a boating revocation. But driving your vehicle back in that trailer end mm -hmm. to get the boat, that can subject you to a driver's license revocation of your actual privilege to operate a motor vehicle. So right there, if they see you drive the boat in, they see you back the truck up and you pull it out, they could get you with operating while intoxicated and boating while intoxicated. Double whammy. Double whammy, absolutely. That's a good thing for people to be aware of right. and, and to understand because we've, we've seen it. We've seen it happen. Yes, we've had we to have. deal with it. Yes. So, okay. So you could lose it hypothetically lose your driving privileges, your boating privileges, and be criminally liable for both of those both that, of those charges. That'd be a really bad summer. That would be a bad summer. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. So if you're going to have to back your boat down or your, your trailer down to get your boat out. Somebody better be sober. You better. You should probably treat your boat and your trailer and, and your vehicle as if you're doing everything that whole, whole day you're not, you're not going to, you don't risk it. You've got to be, you, you can't be impaired. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's a, that's an important thing. Cause that's a, that's a, as I have learned the hard way, backing a boat trailer down is not an easy task. And if you're impaired, it makes it that much easier uh, reason for them to come pull you over. That's right. Yep. And, and they're looking for that. People who are, you know, can't get the trailer straightened out. Even though us down. noobs can't do that on a good day. Right. Right. It's just one more thing that they're looking for. Okay. Okay. All right, so we've talked about boozing and boating. We've talked about life jackets. Um, so let's just say we're ready to set sail. We're ready to push off and get underway. We're good to go, right? So we, we understand the, the boozing. We understand life jackets. We have all that. Nothing else to worry about, right? Uh, not so fast. <laughs> I, I, all right, Lee Corso. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think before you are – taking off from your house even the first thing that you got to do you hook up to your boat um you, you hook up your trailer lights you do an inspection of your trailer lights you got to inspect the whole boat right just make, make sure, sure those that, lights are working because that's a good excuse to yep. get pulled over make sure your lights are working make sure that you know your your plug is in your boat if your boat's got a plug um have you ever done that back not, your boat down without a plug yeah i have <laughs> a, a little boat but it's still it was it, it was uh it could have been potentially bad, yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, making sure that you're you're checking, you know, do do your pre-trip mm -hmm. inspection of your boat and your vehicle. And what 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 do you what do you need to know? So you 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 lights are good, everything's good, plugs mm -hmm. in, you're backing in. Um, what are some easy ways to avoid an easy um, stop on the water by DNR? Sure. So big ones that we see. Um, 
capacity. Yep. So every boat has a capacity number on the rear or the stern of the boat. And um, if you are overloaded, the DNR has the authority to make a stop. So easy way, count the people in your boat, compare it to the number on the back of your boat Correct. if you're over, kick somebody out. Right. The other way you could be overloaded is so that number also correlates to a, um, a poundage uh, or, a, or a, a weight capacity in the boat, and that's on a little placard inside the boat. Um, I don't know if they're going to be doing visual inspections of the weight of people. We don't need to but, scale people in. Right, right. right. Okay. So that's just another capacity issue. So equipment requirements. One more thing before we get to that. Okay. There is um, a capacity designation called OR. That's what I have. My Which, boat's so old it does not have a capacity <laughs> number. So, right. So and and some newer boats even have okay. an OR designation, but that means owner's responsibility. So the owner is responsible for having a um, safe number and weight of people on the boat. So it kind of begs the question: What is the safe number and weight such that the DNR could pull you over? on an OR boat, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, I think that's a um, kind if of, you're open, if you're riding low, throw somebody out. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I think that's kind of a, still kind of an open question, maybe sort of a squishy part of the law, but a lot of this stuff is squishy, mm -hmm. uh, kind of when it comes to checking on safety and I that agree. kind of thing. But so basic equipment that's required to be on a boat that people need to know about. Yep. So, um, so we just talked about the capacity numbers. Um, your, your registration has to be displayed on your boat as well. Mm -hmm. Um, bold block letters has to contrast with the color of the boat. So if you got a dark colored boat, the letters should be light, like white. Uh, if you got a white boat, the letters should be black. Make dark. it easy. Make it easy. Very, it's gotta be visible. Okay. Um, lighting, uh, lighting on your boat. There has to be red and green on the front, um, in the rear, on the stern, there's a white 360 light that's visible from three. They get a lot of people degrees. on that during at, at night, right? Right. So some people have these lights that are like a disc almost mm -hmm. on the top, and some of those bulbs will go out so it's not visible from 360 degrees sometimes. Um, that's one of the biggest ones is having that light pole on the back. It's got to be 3.3 feet higher than the red and green light on the front. So making sure that you have a long enough post for that white light is also pretty important. Uh, what I call the panorama special. The panorama special. Yeah. So, um, sorry about this one, people. This refers <laughs> to, so I guess we should probably say that I think there are only three appellate decisions in Iowa on boats, on boating while intoxicated or boating generally. Yeah. You had one and well, I've had two. You at least one. I lost. I, I won't, I'm like, I'm batting 500 on there, the voting we'll cases, that. but that's Hall of Fame numbers. Um, so really, there isn't a whole lot of case law on it. But um, your case was an issue where a, a DNR officer on Lake Panorama had stopped a boat for displaying a blue light mm -hmm. um, on on the boat at night, right? Yep. Yep. And the issue was so there's a, there's a law that says you cannot display a blue light or flashing blue light on your boat unless you're an emergency vehicle, right? Yeah. Um, so this guy had a blue light on his pontoon, DNR water patrol pulls him over. The whole issue was panorama purports itself to be a private lake, can exclude people from, you know, around the shoreline. Mm -hmm. um, is that a private lake for purposes of whether or not the law applies to that lake? Right. And Supreme Court found that Yes, it does apply to that lake. Uh, it applies to the waters. Uh, you know, that they said that basically was an impoundment of the river because um, the river feeds it. There's a dam. It goes out from the end. So he had the authority to pull that boat over. Moral of the story is do not have a blue light on a boat in Iowa. Right. No blue light. And when you see people with blue lights, we call that business. Yes. So, you know, you see people. Because the marinas sell these pontoons with all the different changing light they colored do. things yep. and they make that a special thing the problem is is when it changes the blue that's breaking the law correct correct yeah, yeah. so if they they yeah. rotate light colors and you're somebody sees you with the blue light that's that's no go all so. right and and for the record we do we didn't bring it up we we, we forgot the pre-ride checklist that we've created for people to be able to go through check off 
hey, we have this, we have our life jackets, mm -hmm. we have our horns, we have our flags, we have our lights working, we have all that. People want a copy of that. It's laminated. You can keep it in your boat. You go through and check it off before each ride. That's right. So let's move on. Top things we wish boaters would appreciate. As El Capitan, right, the wizard, what are some of the things that you feel, if you could make everybody understand and appreciate it, what would, what would those be? Well, I think we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but nobody who's over the age of 18 or 18 and over has to prove their competency to operate one of these boats, a, a motorboat. Um, there are no seat belts in a boat. You're, you're on the water, so if you get ejected and you're not wearing a life jacket, there's, a, there's an additional risk of drowning um, that's not there with being on a roadway. Yeah, you can't roll around holding your head but still breathing. Right, yep. right. Um, if you're injured, you got to be able to swim to keep yourself mm -hmm. above water. So I think just inherently um, more dangerous than a vehicle. Yeah. And, um, and bo bo boats aren't manufactured to absorb impact like no, cars are. Cars no. go through, I mean, they put crash test dummies in the walls. They don't do that for boats. No, I mean, it's either a fiberglass hull or right. it's big, you know, aluminum pontoons, and those are not designed to, they're designed for flotation and speed and whatever else, but they're not designed for impact. Your, your, your mechanism of movement is not going to take the impact for you. It's going to be you. Correct. Okay. That and, you, you know, no, no uh, seat belts. You're going to get launched. You're going in the water. Um, it's, it's more dangerous. There aren't lanes like there are on highways. Um, there are kind of unwritten rules of the lake. You know, you you're not cutting across and things like that and doing dangerous maneuvers, but um, it's not it's not laned like a highway. Well, and, and when, when, when things go bad in a boat, uh, chances are it's catastrophic. Right. I mean, you're talking about um, major potential injury. And you're going to get, I mean, if, if you're the owner and you're operating, you're at fault, you're going to get your ass sued. That's right. And you better have good insurance. Right. I mean, that's the other thing. Insure the damn thing. Progressive right, has right. commercials telling you to insure your damn boat. That's right. You yeah, have it. Ab absolutely. You can't um, have too much. No, not at all. I mean, think about a big pontoon boat. You know, some of these are rated for 14, 15 people. Mm -hmm. um, that's way bigger than your average passenger vehicle. You hit somebody with 15 people on it and kill 15 people. That's a huge amount of liability. Yeah. So, you know, they, they do sell boat insurance. Um, you're not required to have it. It's a good idea, maybe, a, or an umbrella policy or something like that, but get some insurance that covers you for an issue we, like We've that. been on both sides of those cases, yes, and we have. none of them are pretty. No. Well, my friend, I appreciate you taking the time to come in and explain all this stuff sure to us. I hope it was, well, I know it was super interesting and, and enlightening for a lot of people. Appreciate it. Until next time, Grant the Wizard Gangstead, Cheers, El Capitan. Man. Appreciate it, buddy. Cheers. We'll be back with... The do's and don'ts with donut. With the donut. We are excited about that. This is a new site. We just came up with this this week. The donut is making an appearance. We'll be right back. Thank you. We have a group of people that care legitimately about people and that I, in the area of law, it's real easy to get into the judgmental and don't blame us, blame yourself. We don't take excuses. We, we, we're, our, 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 our job is to fix and to rectify the situation. And our staff understands, I think, and appreciates that and takes that to heart in a way that find me, find me a place that does better. We get to introduce a brand new segment. This was your idea. Yes. And we've titled it Do's and Don'ts with Donut. <laughs> this is Sydney Ross. We've talked to we've talked about you, talked you up over the last two weeks. AKA two, Donut. Two episode Donut. And yeah. we're gonna have to get an explanation of that. We don't have time to do that yet. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that teaser out there. Okay. And where donut comes from. And we're gonna get right to this episode. What what are we getting ourselves into with do's and don'ts with donut? So I have been scrolling through Reddit 
and it's That's one of my dangerous. favorite pastimes. Okay. Yes. And there is a subreddit called Legal Advice where people ask questions of a whole bunch of lawyers on Reddit <laughs> and typically share way too much information and ask a ton of questions that should not be asked on the internet. So I've been collecting them. So every week we're going to, or every episode we're going to ask a question and what our first thoughts are or what if someone walked into your office and asked you this question, where you would go with it. Can we get, do a disclaimer that this is not true legal advice? Yes, this is not legal advice. This is not Not attorney. legal advice with donut. Not legal advice. It's <laughs> do's and don'ts with donut. Yes. All right. Are you ready? I don't know. Uh, it's a good one. Shoot, let's go. Okay. So the title of this Reddit post is Drinking at a Party a Murder Happened At. <laughs> I'll keep this brief. Me and a few friends were at a party at an Airbnb. A buddy rented this Airbnb out to party in. The three of us are 19 to 20 years old, obviously drinking and having a good time. Some argument happened and someone shot and killed one guy and put another guy in the hospital. We all left immediately, but me and my friend need to come forward because we have a crucial piece of evidence. I even, or I was given the guy who was shot first aid for a minute before someone more experienced took over. My issue is we're all obviously not 21, and I allegedly left a backpack there with a bottle of whiskey in it. Am I gonna deal with any consequences regarding this? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is real. This is real. This is real. I mean, I have one concern, and please. none of them, well, I have multiple concerns, but I have one big concern, and none of them have to do with the bottle of whiskey. <laughs> yeah, that was my thought exactly. The Priorities? The putting yourself on the scene of a murder, okay. admitting to running away, and admitting to like having hands on the person murdered should maybe come before the whiskey bottle in a bag. Like, maybe this is a cover-up. That's what I'm saying. And if it is a cover-up, you shouldn't be calling yourself in. But who do you suspect if the person's calling you in? I mean, it, it's, it's, that, it's that classic, uh, who would think I did it if I'm saying this is my role? This right? is true. Right. That's a dangerous game. It's a very dangerous game because you are literally putting yourself at the scene there's a reason your DNA is going to be on the yep. theoretically dead person. And admitting you left the scene right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a not advisable to post this publicly. True? Absolutely not. Because this is this is this is 100% public. Yes. Okay. Uh, two. I I have a question with the person's um, priorities in life. Yep. Uh, booze, minor in possession, partying, whatever else is going on in that house. I think pales in comparison to dead person. Yes. Murdered person. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting this call theoretically. That's when you have to have that conversation with the person. Figure out what actually happened. No, 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 no. You, we don't, I mean, there's certain things Valid. you do and don't want to know. Um, as an attorney, especially a defense attorney, you don't want, we can't know the full story. Yes. All the time. It's a little trick. There's a case about that. You probably know it mm -hmm. since you're in the top 1% of the bar exam <laughs> taking people. <laughs> uh, but but we, we have this. I mean, this happens, and the first discussion that you have to have with them is, listen, there are two people you don't lie to in your life, your surgeon and your criminal defense attorney, mm -hmm. because we have to know what role we are actually involved in. Are you potentially, there's other people at that party, um, chances are 19 to 20 year olds, there's social media posts, yep. there's pictures, there's videos, videos Snapchats, all kinds of TikToks, ring doorbells, ring doorbells, whatever it is these days. Um, are you going to be in a position where they're saying you did this as a cover up mm -hmm. as compared to a scared 19 to 20 year old who's worried about getting caught with booze? Yep. Because let's be honest, in this situation, getting caught with booze is the least of your worries. Oh yeah, absolutely. Even if you have nothing incriminating to say, I think the fact that you were at the scene of the murder is... That, that would hopefully cure you or at least uh, delay your, 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 
your party attitude for a little yeah. bit, you would think. Yes. I mean, it, you've been closer, I mean, in years to, to that type of stuff. Than, I have than, never partied with murders, though. Never been a part of that? I haven't. That's a good thing. It is. <laughs> See, that's why you cleared the background. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, the short answer is booze is the least of your worries. Yes. I've never seen a law enforcement agency run around the murder scene handing out MIP tickets. Looking for the bottle of whiskey. Looking for the bottle of whiskey. Although, Iowa City, would they do that in Iowa City? Um, probably, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so certain, certain places that might yeah. happen. Um, but as we tend to do, if you overthink it or really dive in and say, where is this person really coming from? It causes us a few more concerns that we have. You have to have that very direct talk of let's not put ourselves further down a hole. And by the way, what gets posted publicly stays publicly forever. Yeah, maybe that should be the number one concern is posting something like this on Reddit. <laughs> but, but without it, we would not have the do's and don'ts. This is true. With Dona. This is true. So rule one, keep posting things like this. <laughs> <laughs> rule two is probably don't put yourself at a murder scene with DNA and fleeing the scene on a public forum. Can we agree on that? Yes, absolutely. See, there we go. Do's and don'ts with Donut, episode one. There we go. Check. Mm -mm. We'll see you next time, and I'm sure uh, you'll have a few bigger, absolutely. better ones that we can discuss. Yep. Right on. Thank you. We can't change the past, but we will change your future. GRL Law. Thanks for tuning in to GRL Raw. Check us out at grllaw.com.